questions and uh, sort of came across the idea that some of you that are new this week haven't really had a chance to meet my family, so I do want to take a chance to introduce them because I said something about having to get back to my roommate and they said, you have a roommate? And yes, for the last nine years, this beautiful woman has been my roommate. So, eBay, eBay. yes, the dress, the dress is gone, but she's still here. But um, one of my uh, friends, as I shared this last week, and uh, that was actually emceed our, our, our reception, but he still says to this day that the greatest argument for the existence of God is that Laura married me. So, so and uh, for you that haven't met him, these are my kitties. That's Evan Daniel and Lena Joy. So I hope you've had a chance to meet them, and uh, we're usually in the cafeteria on the far side. So Now, tonight is skit night, all right? And I know some of you are still working and getting your skits together. Do that. Uh, do whatever it takes to have your skit ready. It's a fun time. But I want to caution you. Skit night can be dangerous. Even more dangerous than Frisbee. Uh, skit night, uh, many years ago, uh, caused me to have a black eye. <laughs> yes. That black eye was incurred uh, in skit night. It was a self-inflicted wound. Um, <laughs> It, it, I know it's yeah. sad. Uh, Randy probably remembers that. Um, but the part of the skit I was in, I forget what I had to do, but I had to like scream and then run off. And so I screamed and I ran out the door. And as I ran into the, out the door, there was a stairwell there. And, 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 and being the clumsy person that I am, I tripped and sort of went face first into one of the stairs. And uh, they wanted to send me to the hospital, but uh, after calling my parents, they're like, nah. <laughs> Just put him to bed. If he wakes up tomorrow, it'll be all right. <laughs> so I just want you to be careful tonight, all right? Let's uh, try not to have any uh, skit night injuries. Well, it is July 4th. It's a day that we celebrate freedom. Yes, you're ready. And it's an opportunity for us today to talk about freedom. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Because God desires that his children would live free. And the hymn that we just sang, that last verse there where it says that our God is the author of liberty. All right, he's the one who brings freedom. And specifically, I want to narrow down and talk about an area of life that, that brings more bondage than almost any other issue. And it prevents people from living in the freedom that God wants them to live in. And that's sexual sin. And if we're going to live for the glory of God, this is an area of life that we have to deal with. The Bible has a lot to say about it. And this morning, I want to talk to you about purity. Because purity is something that God calls every single one of us to. And purity brings freedom. You're going to hear a lot of messages in the world about sex. But here's what you need to know. Sexual sin promises excitement. It promises pleasure and endless enjoyment and freedom. But it delivers pain, heartache, loneliness, and guilt. And worse than that, slavery. It puts you in bondage. And along with every other sin, it brings death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death is separation. You know, we a lot of times think of death as being something final or the end. All right? But when it comes to death and the way the Bible talks about death, death is, might be better described as separation. Physical death is when your soul, your spirit, is separated from your body, from this temporary flesh that it lives in. And spiritual death is to be separated from God. And sin causes spiritual death. It separates us from the holy God who created us and made us. That's why Jesus came. He came to end the separation that existed between man and God. He came to make a way for us to come back to God. And that's why that verse says the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we think about freedom this morning, as we talk about purity... I want you to realize that our desire for purity, our desire to experience freedom is rooted in the gospel. It's rooted in the plan that God has for you. It's rooted in the glory of God. Never get over the fact that you are a sinner who deserves death. Never, never lose sight of the fact that what you have earned in life spiritually is death. That's what I've earned. All right, a wage is something you deserve. It's something you earn. 
The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Never get over that. That God has rescued you from the curse of death, of eternal death, and he's given you instead eternal life. I love the way that Charles Wesley said it. We sang this the other night. He said, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, and the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. I love those words. It's such vivid imagery and comes out of the book of Acts. And, and I love how, how he describes that, that the dungeon that he lived in of sin and darkness was flamed with light of God. He says, my chains fell off, my heart was free. God wants you to be free. And then he says, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And I don't want you to miss that because that's the heart of the gospel. It's not just that God saves you. It's not just that he forgives you, but he calls you to follow him and to live for him and to live for his glory. He doesn't call you to be saved and then stay in the dungeon of sin. He doesn't call you to experience His grace and His forgiveness and His mercy and then keep living the way that you used to live. We're to experience not only His forgiveness, but His transformation and His grace in our life. We're going to begin in Romans chapter 6, and then we're going to look in 1 Corinthians and eventually uh, 1 Thessalonians. But Romans chapter 6 is where I want to begin for a few moments this morning. And in Romans 6, verses 6 and 7, we read these words. Paul said, Our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. On this day that we celebrate freedom in our country and how thankful we are for the freedom that we have and for the men and the women who had a vision for that freedom, who fought for that freedom, who gave their lives so that we could have that freedom. How thankful we are. But in such a greater way, God wants you to experience a freedom that's better than political freedom. That's spiritual freedom. That's knowing Him and experiencing a living relationship with Him. And He says, you're no longer in Christ a slave to sin. You're free. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. We all still struggle with sin, every single one of us. But in Christ, we have power to overcome sin. We have power to not experience forgiveness, but freedom from sin. Look down in verse 11. And I don't have these on the screen, so look in your Bible. Paul says, So you should consider in your mind yourselves dead to sin and able to live for the glory of God through Christ Jesus. He says, now that you've been transformed, now that you've been saved, now that you've been called into a relationship with your Creator, he says, you should think differently. You should consider yourself dead to sin and able to live for the glory of God. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the ability to live for the glory of God. And you've been called to live for the glory of God. And God never calls you to do something that He will not enable you to do. Isn't that amazing? God never ever once in His Word will ask you to do something. He'll never call you to do something in life that He will not also enable you to do. God never asks us to do something that's impossible. Humanly impossible? Absolutely. He will always call you to go outside of yourself and to trust Him. But He will never ask you to do something that you can't do through His power. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful to know that God never ever asks us to do something that we could not do with His power? So in verse 12 He says, Do not let sin control the way that you live. Because sin brings bondage. Sin steals our freedom. So he says, don't give in to its lustful desires. Don't let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness. Some of your translations may use the word instrument, which is really fitting there. He says, don't let your body be an instrument of wickedness to be used for sinning, but instead give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life. You see, the whole basis for following God and living for Him and living for His glory is what He's done for us. It's a response to His love and His grace and His mercy. It's a response to saying, I used to be a sinner. I used to be chained in a prison of darkness. I was in a dungeon, but the dungeon was filled with light. God took my chains off. He's called me to know Him and to live for Him. That's the basis. That's the motivation for living for His glory. 
It's not because we're trying to earn his approval. It's not because we have to do any works to save ourselves. He's already saved us. It's precisely because we've experienced his grace and his mercy and his love because we've been given new life. He says, use your whole body as an instrument, as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. That's what we've been talking about last week and this week is living for God's glory. He says, use your whole body as an instrument, as a tool for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you are no longer subject to the law which enslaves you to sin. Instead, you are free by God's grace. Aren't you thankful for that? We have been set free. And God wants you to live free. He wants you to experience His freedom. Jesus came and died on the cross so that you could be free and so that we could live in freedom. And if there's an area of life in which so many times followers of Christ have forfeited the freedom that they should be and could be enjoying, it's in the area of sexual sin. Throughout the Bible we see men constantly dealing with sexual sin, ruining their lives. And we realize godly people struggle with this area. And if you're going to live for the glory of God, you have been called to live purely. Purity is essential for living for the glory of God. God created sex. He created it. He designed it. Can we just get that on the table? It was His idea. Alright? And as such, we'd say, what does the Creator have to say about this? If He designed it, if He made it, Will we be willing to trust His plan? The world is going to tell you that sex brings freedom, that purity is just a silly idea, and that there are no restrictions, and there's no boundaries. And the idea of living purely will be laughed at, you'll be mocked, you'll be made fun of, you'll be looked down on, you'll be considered foolish or ignorant or backward. But I want you to know that in a society that disregards God and His ways, you've been called to live differently. God created a bound marriage between a man and a woman. Alright, Jesus affirmed God's position on marriage. Mark chapter 10, you can read it. He very clearly said, a man and a woman. And that's the place that God has created for sex. Purity is something that God calls us to. And here's what I want you to realize. It's good for you. God has a good plan for you. You can trust your Heavenly Father. Why? Because purity paves the way to freedom. It's essential to living for the glory of God and it brings freedom. I don't know about you, but I want to live free. I want to live free in Christ. I want to enjoy the freedom that He paid for. You know, we in this country enjoy incredible freedom. It was paid for and is being paid for by the blood of men and women who serve our country and defend and protect our freedom. Our freedom in Christ was paid for by Jesus Himself with His blood on the cross. And I want to enjoy and live in the freedom that God's called me to. And I want you to as well. Freedom comes through purity. Not only freedom, but intimacy. Purity paves the way to be close to God. It paves the way for you to be close to your spouse one day. It's worth it. It brings freedom from the unnecessary hurt and pain and stress and fear and heartache, from disease, from guilt, from loss of intimacy. God has a good plan for you. Look in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Because freedom, purity doesn't restrict freedom. It brings freedom. It doesn't restrict freedom. It brings freedom. The exact opposite of what the world will tell you is what actually happens. And this is what Paul said about it. As he wrote to the church in, 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 Corinth, in uh, Corinth. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Run away from it. Put distance between it and you. All other sins that people commit are outside their bodies. But those who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Do you not know that your bodies?" are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You see, this body that you have, the Bible says that if you're in Christ, if you know Jesus as your Savior, that God Himself has taken up residence in you. His Holy Spirit lives in you. He's with you. And He's with you everywhere you go. And He's with you in everything that you do. And He says, you need to realize that once you come to know me and you're in Christ, it's not about you anymore. It's not your life anymore. A lot of times we say, well, it's my life. Right? Have you ever said that or heard somebody say that? It's my life. I'll do what I want. 
But if you're in Christ, it's not your life. It's Christ who paid for you, who bought you, who purchased you. Your life belongs to Him. He says, you are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. God desires to be glorified in your body. It belongs to Him. It's part of His temple. And sexual sin is destructive because it will rob the intimacy, the closeness that you can have with God. He won't leave you. He'll never leave you or forsake you no matter what you do in Christ. Sin can never change the status of your relationship with God. You didn't do anything to earn your salvation when you receive Christ. We don't do works to keep our salvation. But what it will do, it was, will, will rob the closeness that you have with God. It'll put distance in your relationship and your fellowship with God. And it will affect your future greatly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 3 says this, It is God's will that each of you should be sanctified. That means set apart. That you should avoid sexual immorality. And that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. He says, we just shouldn't live like we don't know God. We should live differently. He says in verse 6, And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. For the Lord will punish all of those who commit such sins, as we are told and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. I want you to back up and look at verse 6 for a minute with me. Because here's the thing. Not only is sexual sin sin against God, not only is it sin against your own body, the Bible says, but, but look at what he says in verse 6. He says, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. <clears throat> you see, in our walk with Christ, God calls us to view each other as brothers and sisters because we have been adopted into the same family. So if you're in Christ, you are part of my family and I'm part of your family. You're my brothers or my sisters in Christ. All right, We have one Father who's God, right? And so he says we need to relate to each other as brothers and sisters. And he says sexual sin isn't just sin against God. It isn't just sin against yourself, which it is. But he says you're taking advantage of your brother or your sister. And you're inviting them and bringing them into sin. As you are dealing with the issue of purity and sexuality, if you're not yet married, God calls you to see those of the opposite sex as a brother or as a sister, and to treat them like one. And if you keep that in your mind, that'll go a long way to helping you, won't you? It'll go a long way to helping you. God calls you to see them as brothers and sisters. And I want you to know something else. And a lot of, several of you are married in this room. Purity is not just something that you deal with before marriage. It's a lifelong pursuit. And it's a lifelong necessity. And it's a lifelong challenge for every single one of us. No one is exempt from temptation. We talked about that yesterday. And especially in this area, godly people who love God with all their heart struggle with this. And God calls us to live a life of purity. To live differently. And to treat anyone who is not our spouse as a brother or sister in Christ. God wants you to experience freedom. And purity paves the way for freedom. To live a life for the glory of God, you need to live a life of purity. And purity will bring freedom and intimacy. John chapter 8 verse 34. Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. You see, we're free, but we can still act like slaves. We've been set free by Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we can still choose to act like slaves and live like slaves. And God doesn't want you to live that way. I don't want you to live that way. I want you to be able to experience the freedom that purity can bring. Here, here's the issue when it comes to purity. God has set the boundary very clearly that sex and sexual activity is reserved for marriage between the union of a husband and and a wife. It's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. God created it. He designed it. He called it good. It is good. And God isn't trying to keep something from you. He's trying to give something to you. 
And that's why he calls you to trust him and to live purely. He calls you to trust his heart. And really, that's the issue when it comes to purity. Are we going to trust our Heavenly Father? and say, I believe your plan is good. I believe your plan is right. Even though the world says that I'm missing out, even though society says that I'm foolish, even though all these messages tell me that there's freedom and delight and enjoyment and enticement. And you know what? There is for a moment. Remember we talked about yesterday? Stolen bread tastes what? Sweet. Sweet. But afterward it turns to what? Gravel. Gravel. All right, and particularly in the area of sexual sin, that verse is true. In fact, I really believe Solomon may have had that very issue in mind when he talked and shared that verse. Stolen bread tastes sweet, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. So here's the thing. Are you going to trust your Heavenly Father? Are you going to trust your Heavenly Father who loves you, who gave His Son for you, who loves you with an everlasting love, who's covenanted with you for an eternal relationship, who's called you to glory, to live for His glory now, and He's invited you to live in His kingdom for all of eternity, would you be willing to trust that God with your life? Or are you going to push back against your Heavenly Father and say, I don't think in this area you really know what you're talking about. I don't think that you really have my best interests at heart. God wants you to experience freedom. Freedom from the unnecessary hurt and pain and heartache and stress that comes from going outside the boundaries that God has made. I want to promise you, when you go outside of the boundaries that God has set, it will incur heartache and grief and stress and pain and problems and unnecessary worry. And there's enough worry and there's enough stress and there's enough problems in life, isn't there? All right, we don't need to create more for ourselves. The challenge... To live a pure life is the opportunity to live a free life. The challenge, the call to live a pure life is the opportunity to live a free life. And God wants you to live freely. And I want to challenge you to make a commitment while you're here to purity. It's a commitment, I promise you, you will never ever regret. I've counseled lots of people about lots of different issues, but here's one thing I've never dealt with. I've never had someone say, you know, I committed to purity and I really regret it. I've been faithful to my spouse and it's been terrible. <laughs> no one's ever said that. Trust me. But the opposite I have dealt with, the heartache, the pain, the hurt. You have to make a commitment. You can't wait until the moment to decide. When you're in the back seat, it's too late. You need to make a commitment to purity. Job made a covenant with his eyes. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I made an agreement with my eyes that I would not look on women to lust on them. Daniel purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. Joseph valued his walk with God more than the fleeting pleasures of sin. And I want to challenge each of you to do the same. Would you make a covenant with your eyes? Would you purpose in your heart? Would you value your walk with God more than the fleeting pleasures of sin? And would you commit to living a life that's pure? 1 Corinthians 10.31 is sort of the verse that that we have been using to, to guide our thoughts. And Paul says, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And this is a great, great guideline for our lives. Because sometimes we come across gray areas in life, don't we? Where we're just not really sure, should I do this or should I not do this? The Bible doesn't directly deal with this issue, so what do I do? He says, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So you have to ask yourself, is what... I'm about to do or what I want to do. Can I do that to the glory of God? Can I do this thing to the glory? Do it. Always ask yourself, can I do this to the glory of God? And that's the real issue with purity. God calls you to live for His glory and to live a pure life. Some practical things as we get ready to close. Number one, some of you need to deal with your past. I'm not naive. I may be old enough to be your dad, and I am, but I'm not as naive. I know that this has probably been a struggle for some of you, and some of you have already crossed lines that you should not have crossed. And here's what I want you to know. You need to deal with that. Your Father in Heaven sent His Son. 
He died for that sin. It's already been paid for, but you need to bring it to God. And you need to allow His forgiveness to touch that area of your life. And you need to know this. Our God is a God who forgives any and all sin. And our God is a God who heals and restores. And if you've sinned, you need to deal with it. But I want you to know that God will forgive you. And He will restore you. And He can help you to start and begin to live purely now. And that's the most important thing that you can do. Know that God's grace is greater than all your sin. Aren't you thankful for that? I am. I'm thankful that God's grace is greater than all my sin. His love goes further. His grace runs deeper. Deal with your past. Number two, deal with your present. Some of you are in a relationship with a guy or with a girl and it's not healthy. And you know it. And it may be very well that when you go home, you need to have break up. And I don't say that lightly. I know that's not fun. That could be scary. You may genuinely feel like you love that person. But if your relationship isn't honoring to God, if it isn't healthy, if it isn't pure, you need to break up. You need to distance yourself from that. You need to get help. You need to get accountability. I know for some of you, this is your verse this week uh, for your uh, devotions. But 2 Timothy 2.22 says this, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You need to do this with others. We need to encourage one another in our pursuit for purity. We need to push each other, challenge each other, hold each other accountable. Flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And Paul says, and this is Paul writing to Timothy, whom he treated as a son. He had led Timothy to Christ, faith in Christ. He had been a mentor and a father figure in his life. And Paul is about to die when he writes this. He's in a Roman prison. His execution is looming. It's the last thing that we have written from Paul. And he shares his heart. And he says, Timothy, he says, pursue faith, righteousness, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He says, find some people who want to do the right thing and run with them and stick with them and encourage each other. Deal with your present. Number three, deal with your future. Commit to purity. I want to challenge you to make a commitment to purity. No matter what your past is like, maybe up to this point God has kept you pure. That's awesome. Keep that commitment and honor that. Maybe you haven't been, but you know what? You can start fresh. Our God is the God of second chances and fresh starts. And you could say, from this moment on, from this point, I'm going to live differently. By God's grace and by His power and for His glory, I'm going to live differently. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it down. I want you to write down, in your own words, a commitment to purity. There's something powerful about what we write. I want you to write it down. Take some time before you leave camp. Some of you are leaving Saturday. Some of you get to stay for another week. Some of you, two more weeks. I'm jealous. I'll admit it. But I want you to commit to it. Before you leave, write it down. And then I want you to put it somewhere where you can look at it every day. Tape it on the inside of your Bible. Write it, put it somewhere where you'll see it. So it's before you. So you'll remind yourself of your commitment. And then I want you to do some crazy things. Like maybe tell your parents. Tell your parents. Say, you know, Mom, Dad, I just want you to know I'm committed to purity. They will love you for that. <laughs> tell your friends. Anyone who wants to date you. Tell them about your standards and say, hey, if you're not okay with my standards, you might just want to move along. <laughs> tell your pastor, tell somebody, just say, you know, I want everyone to know this is my commitment. Because when we go public with our commitment, it brings a level of accountability that will help us. Paul shares these words in Philippians, and I'll close with them this morning. He says, this is my prayer for the believers in, in Philippi that he loved dearly. He says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. He says, I pray that you'll keep knowing Christ more, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He prayed for them. He says, I pray that you'll be pure and that you'll be blameless because Jesus is coming again. That's our great motivation. We're going to see him one day. And Paul says, I pray that when you see him, you'll be pure and that you'll be blameless and that you will live a life to the glory 
and the praise of God. That's my heart for every one of you because purity brings freedom. And it's worth the struggle. It's worth the challenge because it will provide for you a freedom and intimacy with God and with your spouse one day that is unparalleled. It's worth it. And it's my heart for every one of you to not experience the heartache and the pain and the shame and the regret that comes from sexual sin, but to live purely and to live for Christ. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I just come before you right now. I'm thanking you and praising you for your, your word to us. I thank you that, that your word delivers, Father, truth that we all need to hear. And Father, I pray in this area of purity that you'd help every one of us, from me to each camper, to each counselor, to each faculty member, to live lives of purity because you call us to it. And Father, I pray that, that we would see that this call to purity is a call to honor you, to glorify you, and it's a call to experience your freedom in our life. Father, I pray for anyone in this room who's struggling in the area of purity. Father, in their past or maybe even in their present, there's sin. And Father, I pray that they would realize the need to repent, to turn, and to come to a Father who's waiting to forgive them and waiting to restore them, waiting to heal them, and waiting to empower them to live differently. And Father, for those who desire and have been living purely, Father, may we all commit afresh and anew to living with purity, to making a commitment, to writing it down, to keeping it before our eyes, so that may we, we may glorify you, live in your freedom, and be pure and blameless on that day when we stand before you. Father, I pray that your grace would be at work powerfully in our hearts and our lives for your glory. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.